यानी लाभार्थी के खाते में क्रेडिट कर देता है इस तरह बड़ी आसानी से सिडबी और पार्टनर इंस्टीट्यूशन के माध्यम से बहुत ही कम समय में लोन प्राप्त कर छोटे उद्यमी अपनी जीविका का साधन अपना रहे हैं प्रयास ऐप से अपने प्रयासों को सफल बनाए सिडबी आपके साथ है सिर्फ एक प्रयास की बात है जो आता हुआ अच्छा लगता है लेकिन जाता हुआ नहीं एक और हिंट ये चीज जाती है हर महीने पर आती है तीन महीने में एक बार ब्याज इंटरेस्ट लोन पे तो इंटरेस्ट बैंक हर महीने लेते हैं लेकिन सेविंग्स अकाउंट में इंटरेस्ट देते हैं तीन महीने में एक बार ऐसा क्यों? एयू बैंक के सेविंग्स अकाउंट में इंटरेस्ट मिलता है हर महीने मतलब साल में बारह बार एयू बैंक बदलाव हमसे है presenting two new tech initiatives in the retail microfinance sector Sayok 2.0 app to ensure data security and efficient services with newly added features like eKYC geo tagging and instant credit verification and cashless payments of EMI via any bank UPI for easy and safe transactions All this with the aim to enhance last mile efficiency and delivery for the microfinance entrepreneurs. Zindagi ke kai mausam anubhav kiya maine. Halaat badle, log badle. Agar kuch nahi badla to Babu ji ki sikhai hui ek baat. Wo kehte the jab neev mazboot ho to phir chahe waqt ke utar chadhav kaise bhi ho hum unka dat kar samna karne mein sakshamak. बिल्कुल इस पेड़ की तरह 
ऐसा ही एक अटूट रिश्ता जोड़ता है आपके साथ आईडीएफसी फर्स्ट बैंक विश्वास पारदर्शिता और सच्चाई का क्योंकि इनको आपकी सफलता में अपनी जीत दिखती मैं तो जुड़ चुका हूं इनके साथ आप भी जुड़ जाइए ना आईडीएफसी फर्स्ट बैंक ऑलवेज यू फर्स्ट सिडबीज डिजिटल प्रयास पार्टनर जर्नी आइए देखते हैं इस डिजिटल इनिशिएटिव की जर्नी इस इनिशिएटिव में पार्टनर इंस्टीट्यूशन के माध्यम से very good morning and warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today online online our track today is digital financial inclusion the need to tread responsibly uh, we once again welcome everyone to the day 2 of the inclusive finance india summit uh, we will start off the proceedings today with a keynote address by dr indradeep ghosh who is executive director dwara research it is now my great privilege to welcome dr indradeep ghosh to deliver the keynote address dr ghosh you have the floor Thank you, Mayank, and uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session. So, uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, here is my presentation, and uh, let me just go to. So, I'm going to mute my video while I'm presenting, but here it is. so uh, good morning everyone this is a uh, opening uh, address for the responsible digital inclusion panel and uh, uh, my name is indradeep ghosh i'm executive director of dwara research we are a non profit research foundation based out of chennai india and we are mostly uh, doing policy advocacy and research in the financial inclusion and social protection domains and one of the research verticals that we have in our uh, organization is entirely devoted to thinking about digital finance and digital inclusion so much of what i will present today is really our thinking uh, and uh, the outputs of our research on these questions so uh, here is what my address will look like first i will review very quickly the key developments during the pandemic uh, then i will ask the question why must inclusion be responsible 
uh, and attempt to answer it. Uh, then I will take on the question of how to make inclusion responsible and I will suggest some uh, some uh, ways in which uh, digital inclusion can indeed be made responsible. And then I will leave the audience and the panel with some questions for further exploration. So the first part is uh, key developments uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so the pandemic has had a dire impact on people's livelihoods uh, and financial well-being. Uh, poverty has increased very sharply. Uh, there has been a sharp drop in income levels. And women in particular have been impacted by loss of income, loss of access to essential commodities, uh, greater household burden, and slower recovery. So this has, of course, also led, as many of you know, to a reliance on informal sources of finance, like informal lenders and lending apps. Uh, so that's the first important development during the pandemic. The second one is that there has been also a rapid increase in digital delivery of services. Uh, retail payment systems like UPI, IMPS, AEPS, Bhim Aadhaar Pay, NEFT, uh, have seen a lot of growth during this time. Uh, digital lending has grown very, very sharply, almost 12 fold uh, between 2017 and 2020. Uh, 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 especially personal loans, buy now, pay later loans, small business loans, trade loans, etc. All of these categories have increased sharply. Public sector banks have tended to use their own apps for delivery while private sector banks and NBFCs have typically outsourced the function to third parties. And also the tenure of loans given by banks uh, was largely more than one year, but the loans given by NBFCs tended to be more short term, mostly 90 days or within a year. So that's the second big development uh, during the pandemic. Uh, also in the insurance sector, there have been some key digital developments, uh, uh, greater automation of processes, use of telematics in underwriting processes, use of new technologies like drones in collecting data. And finally, another ar arena where digitization has advanced quite rapidly is the delivery of social security. So the government relied heavily on digital rails like Aadhaar, digitally enabled bank accounts, mobile phones, and DBT back uh, DBT backend system for delivering social security services, including trash, uh, cash transfers, PDS, et cetera, during the pandemic. The third development has been the rapid growth in digital currencies. And this was uh, you know, really surprising or perhaps not surprising that investments in cryptocurrency in India increased by approximately 20,000% uh, between 2020 and 2021. So from 200 million USD to 40 billion USD. And at present, more than one crore people, it seems, are investing in cryptocurrencies. And the RBI has also started talking about a CBDC or a central bank digital currency. Uh, and we could perhaps see something uh, like a CBDC being piloted as early as 2023. Finally, the third major development during the pandemic has been uh, a, a, a rationalization and the introduction of new kinds of redress channels. So uh, the RBI established an online dispute resolution system for providing redress and payments disputes. And various amendments have been made to the Customer Pro Consumer Protection Act uh, that seeks to protect consumers in digital transactions. And uh, again, a recent development is that the R RBI has announced a one bank, one ombudsperson scheme, one ombudsman scheme, where uh, uh, three existing ombudsman schemes, the banking ombudsman, the NF NBFC ombudsman, and the ombudsman for digital transactions have all been unified into a single, uh, into a single office. And uh, this scheme dissolves jurisdiction limitations and widens the grounds of complaint. So this have be, these have been some of the key developments during the pandemic. Uh, now let me take up the question of why inclusion should be responsible. So digitization can, of course, improve financial uh, access to financial services, but it risks exclusion. There are significant barriers to accessing and using DFS that still remain. For instance, uh, disparity in access to wireless telecom and internet services, disparity in internet usage, lack of access to smartphones, 
Then there are demographic barriers, linguistic, literary, digital literacy barriers. There are cultural barriers based on gender and caste. Then there is bank account dormancy and economic barriers, other economic barriers such as cost of purchasing, required ICT, rent seeking, etc. So these barriers still make digitization problematic, the rollout of digitization problematic insofar as they still impede uh, proper access to financial services, especially among the rural population. Uh, secondly, digital financial services may not deliver consistently. Uh, they are susceptible to transaction failures, system downtimes, delays and transaction reversals, which can break the continuity of a transaction. Similarly, they can expose consumers to risk and anxiety. Consumers find it difficult to understand, for instance, why transactions have failed. And this is especially true for cases where the error response codes given by the payment system are highly sophisticated for a simple consumer to understand. Further, in some cases, transaction failures can result in transaction failures. A transaction failures sometimes happen after the consumer's account has been debited. And it may take anywhere between one day to two weeks for the money to return into the consumer's account. And so these kinds of inconsistencies and failures in the delivery of digital financial services is certainly problematic and it remains a challenge for digital inclusion. Safety is, of course, a, con a, a, a primary concern uh, in digital financial services. Uh, uh, there's a variety of customer protection or consumer protection concerns, dark patterns uh, being one of them. Dark patterns can exploit users' cognitive biases and reinforce information asymmetries, manipulating users into making suboptimal decisions for themselves. Uh, the other problem uh, with, uh, uh, with unfair conduct is that uh, sometimes digital financial service providers rely on uh, lengthy, text-heavy, and highly technical privacy notices to take consent from users. So this is what I'm calling poor consent practices. Then there is a host of risks associated with the use of uh, uh, how algorithms are being used in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in decision-making by digital financial services, automated decision-making algorithms, can certainly help process large amounts of personal data and provide more tailored advice, but the outputs may be inaccurate because of problems in the algorithm or in the data set which is being processed by the algorithm. And the problem is often compounded because the algorithm is not always, uh, is not always transparent to scrutiny. Uh, then there are a host of uh, issues related to personal uh, data protection, or what, what I'll call personal data related risks. And th these risks can manifest in a variety of harms stemming directly from the use of personal data like discrimination, unsuitable sale, profiling and manipulation, or from the breach of personal data like fraud, harassment, identity theft, and the distortion of personal data. And finally, there are information asymmetries between the users and the providers that can make digital financial services difficult to understand for users. Uh, for instance, users may not be able to distinguish between who, which providers are regulated and which providers are unregulated. Uh, and this uh, certainly manifested, for instance, last year in the digital lending distress that was so widespread during the, uh, during, uh, the, the pandemic uh, lockdown. Uh, finally, grievance redress is already challenging. Uh, in the offline world, you know, uh, because of low accessibility, uh, redress is often burdensome. Redress uh, often requires uh, technical, pro several technical procedures, and there's high pendency. So these uh, problems with grievance redress alre are already known to exist in the offline world, but these problems are right, like, very likely to carry over into the digital world. And then uh, the digital world may add its own problems on the grievance redress front, uh, partly because of all of the other problems that have already been mentioned earlier, uh, but also because DFS, you know, because uh, the digitization of financial services also means the modularization of financial services. Uh, grievance redress becomes even more challenging in a digital world because Typically, modularization means that multiple entities are performing specialized functions and users may seldom understand uh, the reason why a transaction has failed or why a grievance has been caused or which party has is responsible for the transaction failure. Uh, 
so so therefore the users would find it difficult to identify the redress forum uh, with which they must file a complaint. Now, certainly the integration uh, of the three uh, uh, ombudsmen, as I mentioned earlier, is a positive step, step in this direction, but redress procedures can still be highly technical and burdensome for users with high rates of rejection, slow pace of redress, and high, high rates of pendency. So these are some of the reasons why I would argue that digital inclusion, uh, although it can improve access to and uh, to financial services, still uh, uh, needs to be responsible. So how do you make inclusion responsible? So first of all, providers must deploy a strong ethic of responsibility in their uh, processes. Um, and what does this mean? It means that providers must design processes, products, and services for the user's con uh, context. For instance, uh, they must review onboarding processes and reduce the barriers for new and low-income consumers. They must design consent practices to suit users who are new to DFS and who may have low and who may operate in constrained context. Constrained context in the sense of users who have low literacy, low technological capabilities, or they may face other barriers. Uh, providers must design user interfaces that are transparent, non-manipulative, and easy to understand. And this is especially true for new users. Uh, providers must design technological and process solutions to improve suitability assessments. Um, uh, so, so in other words, providers must develop processes that ensure that the product or the service that is being sold to the consumer is actually suitable for the consumer. And then providers must also uh, uh, pair digital delivery and digital processes uh, with offline touch points and community level, level agents for delivering uh, DFS at the last mile. Uh, providers must also use technology responsibly. And uh, I've already stated earlier, all of the different concerns that arise because of digitization and the use of data. So providers must, for instance, embed data protection safeguards throughout the data life cycle. That means from the point of data collection to the point of data deletion. Providers should adhere strictly to data protection laws and proactively ensure safety and security of personal data. And secondly, providers must design and use AI systems responsibly. Uh, and what this really means is that the AI systems should adhere to ethical frameworks and they must also ensure adequate room for human intervention in their decision-making processes. Uh, providers must also adopt measures to protect consumers against third-party attacks like fraud. They should design easily accessible and effective redress systems, for instance, by creating local touch points where users can file grievances, by utilizing technology to improve the effectiveness of redress systems, and by utilizing grievance redress mechanisms as feedback loops to improve DFS. Uh, and finally, ensure that uh, the providers must also ensure the capacity and sustainability for providing DFS without disruptions. Now, uh, one of the things that is often missed is how important grievance redress will be, is already and will be for creating trust, uh, especially among low-income households and especially among new users of DFS. And, uh, and I think one of the ways to uh, think about grievance that is still not quite uh, 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 well understood or well accepted in the in, among FSPs, digital FSPs, is that uh, grievance has to be seen as as the uh, as the twin of consent. That means that if you are going to take consent from customers uh, to use their data, then you must also become responsible for addressing their grievances in a timely and effective manner. And without uh, prop a proper, uh, you might even say that consent is uh, not legitimate unless it is followed through with uh, effective and timely grievance redress processes. And I think that this will be the key to uh, creating trust among, uh, among new users of digital financial services. Uh, so finally, I will leave the audience with some questions for further exploration. 
and uh, uh, these questions are you know trust privacy and autonomy seem to be key aspects of responsibility and questions arise in how to operationalize these elements so for instance one question that arises is are trust privacy and autonomy sufficient for responsibility or is there more to be folded into this idea of responsibility uh secondly what measures can providers take to build trust to strengthen autonomy and to clearly demonstrate privacy and safety safeguards and finally the third question is how can market monitoring mechanisms be developed to help regulators and providers identify consumer protection concerns in the digital space promptly uh and finally i think an absolutely crucial question that is not asked enough uh and when it is asked it is not answered very carefully is this question of whether there is a business case for responsibility and my own take on this question it's a difficult question uh my own, and and sometimes it is easy to answer this question uh quickly and say that of course there is a business case for responsibility because if you're not responsible you will lose customers but i think that that answer is a little glib uh in in fact uh, uh when you really think about this the, uh, it is difficult to make a business case for responsibility in the short to medium term you might be able to make one for the long term when already you have customers but in the run up to actually acquiring customers uh uh it is not uh, obvious that there is uh, that being responsible is necessarily the best uh business strategy and so i think this is a question that needs to be tackled uh, and tackled honestly and sincerely and my sense is that uh, the the that the response that the uh, responsibility of behaving ethically uh, should not be left to individual uh, digital financial service providers but must be uh, first of all it must be in some sense regulated but in the absence of regulatory frameworks it has to be the charge has to be led by industry associations so uh, it has to be led at the collective level so uh, i will leave the audience with the, this set of questions perhaps the panel will take it up for discussion uh, but uh, that is the end of my presentation and thank you thank you dr ghosh uh, we have a question from the audience uh, we yeah, have the question is what are we doing regarding raising awareness to raise for people to be able to raise the issue and complain easily if you could just give us a quick quick answer to that um regarding awareness i'm not uh, understanding the question uh, how do we raise awareness in the community so that they can raise the issues yes yes so this is where community level uh, uh, human agents are very important Uh, you know you can't leave it all to digitization uh, community level uh, uh, you might have seen in my presentation i made the point that one of the ways in which providers can act responsibly is to pair their digital delivery systems with offline community level agents who will actually assist the customers to raise their grievances uh, with the financial service providers and even and 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 create an awareness among customers that grievance redress channels in fact exist of course after that the grievance redress channel itself has to perform in an efficient and timely manner for the customer to uh, to gain the necessary trust if after all of that the grievance redress channel does not work effectively then uh, you're liable to lose the customer thank you dr ghosh for responding to that question and thank you dr ghosh for such an insightful and thought provoking keynote address it was really comprehensive and uh, it provided a comprehensive overview of the challenges and concerns in the digital sector space and uh, it really sets helps set the tone for the rest of the discussions that we have lined up throughout the day today where we'll okay. be looking at both the potential of the digital financial inclusion space but also majorly the risks and concerns in the space uh, so thank you once again for the keynote address uh, and uh, we'll say goodbye to you uh, once again thank okay, you all thank the you my thank you once again thanking all the delegates who have logged in for the session we will be back with the next session which is uh, towards a more resilient future leveraging responsible digital financial inclusion for improved financial health this session will start at 10:15 so please feel free to grab tea or coffee in the next 5 to 7 minutes and be back with us for 10 at 10:15 thank you kya hai jo aata hua acha lagta hai lekin jata hua nahi ek aur hint ये चीज जाती है हर महीने 
पर आती है तीन महीने में एक बार ब्याज इंटरेस्ट लोन पे तो इंटरेस्ट बैंक हर महीने लेते हैं लेकिन सेविंग्स अकाउंट में इंटरेस्ट देते हैं तीन महीने में एक बार ऐसा क्यों 